Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful. We are humbled. And there is a sense of completeness because some of us can be together and it's been months. So in the midst of of these feelings, we want to praise you, to give you glory and honor, and to thank you for joining us on this lawn. Thank you for joining us as we sing, as we pray, as we listen to you through many, the many different ways you're going to speak to us today. And then as we pray, prayerfully consider how we respond. So thank you, Lord. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. So good to see you. Um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, Tuesday night we're going to be able to return to doing um, a dual um, prayer and Bible study. We will get, some of us will be gathering. You're welcome to join us at 6.30 in, in the sanctuary. And we will also be Zooming um, the prayer and Bible study uh, starting at 6.30. Restore Network is still in search of diapers, wipes, and pampers um, for children. So bring them, okay? And the alabaster offering is being collected uh, this month. And the alabaster offering, if you don't know, is used uh, for property and buildings, and this year it's going to be used in work and witness teams. If you will open your Bibles to Psalm 72, we're going to read the first seven verses. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness, your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures, and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. We have many things to pray about this morning. There are many people in our country and around the world that are in danger from a number of things. It's unimaginable the number of fires that are burning in the West and that another uh, hurricane is bearing down on Louisiana and Mississippi. All of us bring concerns and all of us bring hurts disappointments that need to be healed. So join me in prayer. And as you do, voice your concerns and your thanks. Let us pray. Lord, we're here today to worship you. We're here today because we have nowhere else to go. You bring us life in the midst of death and destruction. We remember those who are in the middle of that literally this this morning, and we know they need courage and wisdom and safety, and they need people to act on their behalf. We can't do much here physically, but we can 
beseech you on their behalf. And so collectively this day we do, Lord. We ask for you to intervene in the lives of people in danger. Lord, we're grateful that um, Belinda Floyd came through her surgery and is with us. We're grateful that others are here feeling a little more comfortable because we're outside. And we're happy to see one another after some months. But we also want to remember Stacy Glenn and the difficulty she's having with her pregnancy and the possibility of her child needing to be induced and, and born early. Be with those who are making those decisions. Be with their health. And this day, Lord, we pray that your spirit will open our minds and hearts once again to a fresh blessing of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to um, do a couple things a little differently. Now, you're spread out, and I'm happy to see you, but some of you haven't seen each other in a while. You're not going to run over and hug each other even though Ruth wants to. All right, she would vote for that, but uh, many of you would. So what you're going to do is you're going to wave. And while you're doing it, wave to the folks who are joining us. No, no, don't give me this little, aren't you glad to see each other or not? All right. And those of you who are joining us by Facebook, you get your wave. It's not as good as an in-person wave, but that's just my generation speaking, okay? So, all right, it's good to see you. Um, this morning, we're going to do... Uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to hear from some of our folks. Rick Parks is going to kick us off uh, with a, a short, short testimony. He said, he said short twice. I heard that loud and clear. Uh, uh, I wanted to share just a little bit about what Belleville First Church <coughs> of the Nazarene means to me and my family. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home, uh, God-fearing Christian parents, went off and attended Olivet Nazarene University, graduated from there, met uh, my wife, Tricia, and it was in 1989, uh, January of 1989, that we settled in the Metro East area. We attended another church one Sunday morning and decided to come to Belleville First Church of the Nazarene that Sunday evening to try that church out, and we have never been any place else. So I'll tell you just a couple of reasons why that, why that is. So 31 and a half years ago, we came to Belleville first and very quickly fell in love with this place. Uh, and it's provided me and my family several things that I thank God for often. Uh, the first of which was the opportunity to lead and to serve. When Trish and I arrived here, that was 31 and a half years ago, we were 31 and a half years younger, so we were, we were pretty young, shortly out of college, and like a lot of, lot of times, uh, enthusiastic young uh, Christian uh, young people do, we served as youth leaders here, so we had the opportunity to serve as the, the youth, uh, youth leaders after uh, uh, Larry and Pearl had been serving at the time, so uh, gave us the opportunity to do that. I also served later on as church treasurer worship leader for 25 years and have been on the board most of that time so it's been a fantastic opportunity to 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 uh, to serve um, to serve to serve God uh, another thing that I am delighted about that and thankful for is the rich deep friendships that we've established over those 31 and a half years our closest relationships outside of family are uh, from Belleville First Church of the Nazarene I thank God for that it's been a wonderful place to raise our children as well. They have many, many fond memories, and they, they have a, a, a great, strong Christian foundation was established because of the Sunday school teachers and the vacation Bible school and the sermons that they heard uh, faithfully at this place. It's also a place where uh, we have seen Christ-likeness lived out, and there are many, many people over the years that um, I think of Virgil Clubs. Many of you don't know Virgil. Some of you don't. But uh, he developed cancer, and his testimony 
all throughout his, not only his life, but as he was also passing, was just uh, tremendous to see. I also think of Bill Brandon and his uh, rich testimony as he was in his final days of his life. And there were several that we have seen come to Christ here. So to see Christ lived out has been a blessing. And it's also been a great opportunity for me to, to grow in my own spiritual walk. I remember, this was three pastors ago, I was asked to be the worship leader. And I had never done that before. I had musical, maybe, experience, but I never, never led worship. And I remember specifically uh, asking God, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, well, you've got to put, you've got to stir a desire in my heart to do that. And that, that was my prayer. And uh, God is faithful. And he did inspire that, that, that passion uh, for leading worship. And uh, it was a blessing, as I said, to do that for many years. So it was a testament to God's faithfulness. We ask and he answers our, our prayers. Um, and so those are a few things that I just want to say thank you to, uh, to God for Belleville First Church of the Nazarene. If you've got your Bibles with you, or however you're reading Scripture these days, open in to Matthew 5. We're going to read beginning in verse 17. Now, I don't think I need to really illustrate uh, that we're living in a time of uncertainty. The fact that we're meeting outside and not having dinner on the grounds afterwards is an indication there's something unusual. I mean, if we were here and had planned that we were going to eat uh, on the church grounds afterwards, then that would be normal, wouldn't it? Any, anybody of you, have, it, it, surely somebody has done that. Oh, well, you guys got to go to the south. I mean, even South St. Louis, we, we did that, okay? This is an unusual day that we're living in. And it's full of change. Now, my purpose today is not to focus on the uncertainty. It is not to focus on the change. My purpose today is to focus on the fact that we stand on solid ground while everything else around us is changing. Now, in the midst of that, there, the Scripture always gives us this, this, this warning. We're told to beware of false prophets. Now, false prophets come in sheep's clothing. But false prophets, false prophets pollute the air with religious and political voices who excite our uncertainty and take advantage of our fear of change. They stoke fires that generate fears so they can manipulate us. My goal is that you have a firm place to stand so that you and I are less likely to be manipulated by anyone or anything other than the Holy Spirit. And my prayer is, is this sermon is not one of the contributions to air pollution. So let's read Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, <coughs> not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, air pollution isn't something that's just a problem for us. Jesus had to contend with air pollution. He knew about it. You see, Jesus lived in a time when there was lively debate, contentious debate, about what the Torah was, what it 
how it was conveyed. Judaism at that time was fractured into many, many schools of thought that battled openly about the Torah and its application. The fact that we don't realize that about the background and under which Jesus' ministry should be viewed gives us a little bit difficulty in understanding. This wasn't a recent development. It had been going on for centuries. Uh, and in fact, several centuries before Jesus was born, an oral tradition began to develop that began to compete with and claim a right to interpret the written law, the written books that we know of as the Old Testament. And Jesus was frequently dragged into these controversies. Now, there are three mistakes. Well, there are more than that, but there are three common mistakes we make when we approach this material. We mistranslate Torah. Um, we, Torah is frequently translated as law, and it isn't just that. It's more commonly translated as instruction or word. We lump the second one is we lump various types uh, of laws and instructions together and, and make no distinction. <coughs> make no distinction between them. And finally, we treat obedience to the law as an end rather than a means. The third is the most deadly. So Torah means instruction in Hebrew. And when we don't make distinction between it and commandment or statute, it may be that we're not informed, but it may be that we're just lazy. And much of our lack of understanding of Scripture comes frequently because we're just too lazy to study it, too lazy to become informed. We do not make a distinction between the Ten Commandments as law and everything else. The Ten Commandments and the dietary laws are given equal weight by many preachers in, over the last quarter of a century in their claim that they believe the entire Bible. Well, I believe the entire Bible, but I believe it contains dietary laws and it claims the Ten Commandments and those ain't the same thing. The Ten Commandments are the bedrock principles of God's revelation to us about how he wants us to treat him and live with each other. And we have an obligation that we shirk. We have an obligation in times like these, times that are changing, times when we're uncertain, to engage in open debate, to argue with each other, to try to determine the best way that the Ten Commandments can be applied in this age in which we live. But we have allowed ourselves to be backed into corners so that we can't give each other the freedom to have different opinions and different processes to work towards that end. And in a faith that we're all working towards the same place. And that is the glory of God and the ability to live His kingdom the most fully as we can in this day. And then there's the problem of making the law an idol. God doesn't want us to be obedient. Oh, that's, a, that's a timely pause. I'm not done. Okay. God doesn't want us to be obedient for obedience sake. God wants us to be obedient because that's the means by which we have a right relationship with him and with each other. The Ten Commandments are given to provide a very practical moral standard 
which makes it possible for us to live together in peace and prosperity. Now, there are other aspects of the law. There's a ceremonial law. The ceremonial laws describe how you give a um, sacrifice, when you give a sacrifice, where you give a sacrifice. They just describe how you give your offerings, how you approach the priest, how you pray. There, there are just myriads of those types of laws within the Old Testament. The book of Leviticus is a good example. As a Christian looking back on it, uh, you should be interested in those laws because they are a foreshadowing of what Jesus will do and how he becomes the means by which our worship is lifted up to God. Then there were judiciary laws. You see, when the, the children of Israel left Egypt and finally got into the promised land, they first lived together as 12 tribes, and they were governed by a less central means of enforcing the Ten Commandments. But when Saul became king and the, and the uh, realm was set up, things shifted. And laws were necessary for how you enforce the laws of living together. how you get justice. But Calvary took care of those. That and the fact that we are no longer living in a situation where God is our ruler. We're living in a nation state called the United States with a secular authority. You and I are citizens of that state but as believers in Jesus Christ, we're also citizens of the kingdom. And the judicial laws for that were taken care of by Jesus. The only wall was, how do we get past our sin? Calvary took care of that. The resurrection took care of that. So, Jesus is the bedrock. He is the one who took the place, and literally, and this was the problem that they were having with him, he took the place of Moses. Moses had been the original template of what a prophet should be. He was the one who went and met with God. He was the one who brought back the word of God for the people. He was the one who helped them develop instructions and structure for how to live the Word of God. And so when Jesus started speaking with authority, the religious leadership, the scribes and the Pharisees, took exception to his inserting himself into this role that had been reserved for Moses. That was part of the problem. Jesus was taking the place of Moses. And so they said, you've come to destroy the law and the prophets. And he said, no, I haven't. I have come to set them full. And so Jesus does that in his life and in his ministry. He takes care of the law. He doesn't set them aside. He sets them full. He completes the expectations of ceremony and judicial law so that we may focus on moral law, how to live together. Moral law is God relating to his creation and love. God is love in the Old Testament. God the Father is love in the Old Testament, not just in the New. But moral law is also the creation responding to God in love. So if you think we talk about justice and mercy too much, then you've got an issue with Jesus. You've got an issue with Jesus. 
Now, what about the prophets? There have always been prophets, and Moses was a prophet. He went and met with God and delivered God's message to the people. But the classic prophets didn't come along until the kingdom, when the society was clearly out from under direct control by God, when there was an expectation of, of the secular society growing up inside uh, of the nation. And the prophets took to task the king the court, the priest, and the people when they failed to live the law that God had revealed to them. And it was the prophet's responsibility to demonstrate the fact that they were not living as they ought. So Jesus comes along. He talks about that. But more importantly, he lives that. He lives the expectation that his life will reflect a prophetic message from God. So Jesus didn't replace the prophets. He extended the ministry of the prophets. And friends, you and I have the same responsibility living in the kingdom. We have the responsibility to extend to others the opportunity to live in right relationship with God, which is governed by our interpretation of the Ten Commandments. But we cha we've changed that interpretation. We don't want to admit it. When my children were 13, I would take them to Deuteronomy 21. I believe it's verse 22 and following, where it says, if you have an unruly son, a disobedient son, and he won't listen to you, take them to the city gates, and the city fathers will stone him to death. I always thought it was appropriate for family devotions on somebody's 13th birthday. The problem was they knew I wouldn't do that. And if I would, no, their mother wouldn't allow me. Okay? But that's part of the judicial law. How many of you have ever t thought about taking your... No, no, that's the wrong one. How many of you have ever actually taken your kids to would have done something like that? None of you. So we've already checked that one off and set it aside. Why? Because it is not an appropriate interpretation and living out of the Ten Commandments today. Now, does that mean we shouldn't train our children, expect them to be disciplined, and expect the community to help us discipline them? That's a, that is fully appropriate. Throwing stones at them probably isn't. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. And he says we have to live with righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and scribes focused on ceremonial and judicial law. And it undercut the application of the moral aspects of the law. How many of you have heard of Corbin? It's not a town in Indiana. Corbin. It is a, an ancient practice in Judaism whereby you can devote your wealth to God for God's purposes. By the time of Jesus, it had become a means by which the Pharisees could avoid being responsible for their elderly adults. In the last decade or so, this has become a bigger issue with me than it was before. And Jesus said, how is it that you can honor, say you honor the law and do something like this? And it, uh, was it Matthew 23 where he says, you tithe mint and cumin and, of, and ignore the weightier, the weightier 
the weightier aspects of the law. The weightier aspects of the law are that you and I should treat each other and the people around us with the love demonstrated to us by Jesus Christ. And that that love causes us to live with them so that we do not breach the commandments that God has given us in the Ten Commandments. We've got new challenges today. Those challenges have been brought to us by science. They've been brought to us by modern living. They have been brought to us by a number of things that Christians and previous generations would never expect. But we got them. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands. But I bet you would identify with the fact that sometimes we just don't know what God wants us to do. That there are some people we just don't know how God wants us to love them. Or even if we should love them. That there are certain practices in our business that, that we wonder if it brings honor and glory to God and we're just not quite sure. We got different questions and we're afraid to talk to each other about it and admit the fact that we don't know exactly how to pursue the will of God and get help from one another because we're so afraid that we are going to be judged by our fellow believers because we have been. Until we can be a people that is lovingly supporting of one another in times of change. Our social house is burning. If we were in California, you would know how to help. Our social house is burning, and we don't know what to do, and we're afraid to talk to each other about how to do it. And Jesus says, unless we figure it out better than the Pharisees and the scribes, we will not have a place in the kingdom of heaven. A living faith is when we encounter God face to face. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And not be, he said, no, don't be a polluter, Dwight. See, I would let them stay until after I got through preaching, but then I'd probably forget they were there. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, and whoever will open the door, I will come in and eat with them. Jesus' desire is to have fellowship with us in times like these. Some years ago, I heard a story about a father who was having difficulty, uh, discipline issues with his son. And he told his son, if he continued to break the rules of the house, he was going to send him to the attic where they had an old dusty cot with only a piece of bread and a glass of water. And he'd spend the night up there until he learned how to be an obedient son. Well, you can predict what's going to happen. I know the son was once again this not mindful of what his father had to say. So the father sent him to the attic with a glass of water and a piece of bread and sat down to dinner with his wife and the boy's mother. She watched him during the meal, and she said, Don't you do it. Don't you dare do it. If you do it, he is never going to respect you again. Don't you go get him. Because she knew that's what he was thinking. Even though he was harsh, even though he liked to think of himself as a disciplinarian, he was on the verge of going and getting the boy and bringing him out of the attic. He thought about it for a minute and he said you know you're right i'm not going to break my word and go against what i said i don't want my son to lose respect for me or for us but you know he's probably got to be very lonely up there so he got it from the table he kissed his wife wished her good night went up the stairs and into the attic. 
he had bread and water with his son. And when the boy went to sleep that night, in the attic, he rested his head on his father's arm as his pillow. God didn't leave us here. God didn't leave us here alone with bread and water. He took flesh and he lives among us. And that life extends to those around us through us. That's our call. That's our purpose. We're reminded of it in many ways and at many times, but never more certainly than when we take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. In Jesus' day, all the things were foreshadowing about what God was going to do. In the Lord's Supper and baptism, we are reminded of what has been done for us. You and I have eternal life in Jesus Christ because of his taking flesh, his coming into our attic. So we're um, going to be joined now by Pastor David Samajoya, um, who's going to come in and lead us uh, in the Lord's Supper. While he's doing that, let me tell you that I am very happy to see you and that we have been able to spend this part of this morning together. We're going to be dismissed. And I think if the Apostle Paul were writing now, he would not tell us to greet one another with a holy kiss. He would say, greet one another with a holy wave. Six feet apart. Okay? You're dismissed.